Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is uh, Amin Saikal. I'm the director of the Centre for Arab and Islamic Studies at the Australian National University. Today, it's my uh, very great pleasure to welcome Dr. David Kalkalan to the Australian National University. I'm sure it's not your first visit. No. You have been here for a number of times, but perhaps uh, once again to welcome you, and particularly the Centre for Arab and Islamic Studies and uh, Australian National University. Um, David uh, doesn't need an introduction. His name has already become a household name, and uh, everybody knows about it. Even my youngest daughter asked me this morning, he said, oh, is this the guy that I saw his picture in the camera time yesterday? He's going to give a talk. And I said, yes, and uh, she's at Radford College. Uh, but just to uh, refresh your memory, uh, David is a former Australian Army officer with combat experience in Southeast Asia and the Middle East. Um, however, in his role as advisor to senior U.S. personnel, he has served in every theater of the war on terror, uh, something which the Obama administration has really dropped, uh, uh, and they are no longer uh, using it. And that has been the case since uh, the tragic events of the uh, 11th of September 2001. He served as a special advisor to counterinsurgency to former Secretary State, Condoleezza Rice, a senior counterinsurgency advisor to General David Petraeus in Iraq, and chief counterterrorism strategist for the U.S. State Department. He, in effect, became the key architect of the West's revamped military strategy. Uh, David has come to us from a very rich intellectual as well as uh, operational uh, background. He also has a PhD in political anthrop anthropology. He's probably one of the very few people who is specialized in political anthropology, at least in this country anyway, and been a frequent commentator on major news and current affairs program. His uh, new book that you've all probably uh, seen, and you're going to buy copies of it, which are available in the foyer afterwards, <laughs> uh, that's what I'm paid for to do, and it's, uh, it's called The Accidental uh, Gorilla, Fighting Small Wars in the Midst of a Big One. Um, and, and it's, uh, I think, uh, uh, if it hasn't become an international bestseller, it's bound to become one. Um, so, so his topic of uh, talk today is precisely on the topic of his uh, book, on the title of his book, and I'm uh, absolutely delighted that he's been able to take time off from a fairly busy, busy schedule to come and speak to us on this topic today. Uh, David has kindly agreed to speak for about half an hour, 40 minutes or so, and then we will have about 20 minutes of uh, questions and answers. Uh, and I'm delighted to, to present to you David Kalkalan. Thank you. Thanks. Well, I'm delighted to be here, and I thought, I, as discussed, I'd talk for about 20 or 30 minutes about my book, um, and then throw the floor open and pick up whatever issues you guys want to discuss. Um, it's pretty obvious to me that uh, I think I recognize about two thirds of the people in the audience. So um, I'm talking to people who know at least as much about a lot of these topics uh, as I do. So what I thought I'd do is just lay out some of the more general themes in the book and then see which of the many issues we could talk about you actually want to talk about uh, and then we can spend the rest of the time uh, focusing on that. Um, in the book, I essentially start with an analysis of the international security environment. And I thought I might talk about some of the, the elements of that, and then perhaps in Q&A, get into a little bit more detail in terms of the on-the-ground case studies, which are the, the heart of the book. Um, at the start of the book, I say, look, before 9-11, uh, there was a belief which was fairly widespread in Western military circles that the days of large-scale ground combat involving Western military powers, particularly democracies, were somewhat numbered, that we weren't going to see uh, future warfare involving you know, large-scale forces of the United States or the Western alliances getting out on the ground and engaging uh, in major combat. I was actually at the Australian Staff College in 2001 when we had a, a visit from uh, an American general who basically said, look, the United States and the Western allies have reached such a point of military dominance in conventional war fighting that no sensible enemy is going to fight us anymore. Uh, and therefore, warfare as we know it is a thing of the past. People are going to confront the West economically, uh, ideologically, with a variety of non-military means, but we're not going to see uh, large-scale conventional combat. And of course, that turned out to be both true in the sense that people weren't going to confront us uh, 
uh, with conventional warfare, but also radically uh, overly optimistic, I think, in that we've certainly seen since 9-11 uh, that far from being a thing of the past, ground combat involving uh, Western military forces uh, in uh, complex, urbanised, tribalised, coastal environments has become really the, uh, the centrepiece of, of, of what militaries are doing now. So I said, look, you can look at the environment and you can see, let's, let's take out of the many ways of, of thinking about the environment, let's select four and see how, uh, what, what they, they seem to say about the environment. And the first way of thinking about it is the idea of a backlash against globalisation. And this, this model is the idea that uh, the process of globalisation over the last 20 or 30 years has led to a uh, much freer flow of ideas, uh, goods and services, human beings, uh, but also weapons uh, and uh, drugs and, and uh, various other problematic elements uh, across the world, uh, which has allowed uh, some countries to do very well and others have begun to feel uh, quite dispossessed or threatened by the patterns of globalisation. And I talk about how in many traditional societies around the world, there's a view that Western led US dominated globalisation is deeply corrosive of traditional identity. Uh, and I use some examples from Europe, which are relatively benign, such as the slow food movement, which was actually started in 1986 as a backlash against the opening of a McDonald's franchise in Rome. And a bunch of people got together and said, this is unacceptable. Our sort of cuisine identity is being taken over. Let's push back with a, uh, a completely different way of thinking about cooking and eating and serving food and so on. That's the most benign end of the scale. But then you see backlash uh, in the form of protests against uh, symbols of globalisation, such as the World Economic Forum, uh, the World Health Organisation, the World Bank and so on, and some of those protests can be extremely violent. You also see uh, low-level warfare in parts of Africa, the Middle East and Southeast Asia between different groups in society who are defined by their responses to globalisation. So you see parts of Nigeria where uh, farmers who are involved in growing uh, vegetables for the European supermarket uh, industry are uh, being attacked by uh, other parts of society who see that as uh, betraying uh, the basis of, of, of the traditional economy. You see similar sorts of things in the Philippines uh, and other parts of the Middle East uh, and so on. But then at the, mo at the most uh, violent end of the spectrum, we see a variety of different groups around the world pushing back against the West and essentially trying to define their own cultural territory um, by the use of violence and reject any kind of Western influence. The second element uh, or the second model of looking at the environment is to say that this generalised turmoil that has to do with globalisation is being exploited and manipulated by certain small elements uh, of radicals uh, in various parts of particularly the Islamic world. And obviously the most well-known example is Al-Qaeda, but it's certainly not the only example uh, of small cliques of radicals who ride the back of a wave of social discontent and exploit and manipulate a large number of small local groups and sort of point them all in the same direction to generate an aggregate effect. Uh, and some people have talked about this as a global insurgency. Uh, I think it's legitimate to talk about it as an insurgency, but it's probably not legitimate to say that the response to that is going to be traditional counterinsurgency because it's a very different sort of environment when you transpose uh, rebellion against authority from one country to the entire Islamic world or to entire continents in some cases. Um, but so the second model is to say, look, in addition to this backlash against globalisation, we're seeing uh, a globalised insurgency that's exploiting uh, the backlash and trying to generate effects uh, against the West. The actions that Western powers have taken since 9-11 to deal with that very small radical clique in a lot of these countries, uh, as I argue in the book, have been largely counterproductive. If you look at the parts of the world where we intervened directly after 9-11 because there was a terrorist presence or a suspected terrorist presence in a particular country, and you compare those parts of the so-called war on terrorism with the parts like Indonesia or the Philippines or some other parts of the world, like southern Thailand, where Western powers did not intervene directly, then you see that the areas where we intervene directly, we've done a lot more damage uh, and we've created a lot more turmoil and generated a lot less benefit than areas where we tried to work 
through local partners and allow them to solve local problems using local solutions. And so one of the implications of this global insurgency way uh, of looking at the environment is to say that it turns out that, you know, surprisingly enough, people get upset when you invade their country because you think there might be terrorists there. Uh, and if you are going to be in the business of intervening unilaterally in other people's uh, countries to deal with a small terrorist clique, then you better come prepared for this major backlash and all the sorts of things that go with that. And I quote in the book from Osama bin Laden, who made a statement in November of 2004, where he said, all we have to do is send two mujahideen to the furthest point east with an al-Qaeda flag, and the Americans will panic and send an army there and engage in essentially a costly series of interventions. Uh, and once we've got them soaked up in one area, we just do it again, and we'll continue with this process of provoking a response from the United States until the US is pinned down, exhausted, uh, and bankrupted. And he talks about a strategy of exhaustion and bankruptcy. Now, this is a snapshot of al-Qaeda thinking, which has evolved dramatically uh, since that time. Uh, but it's certainly true that if the enemy's prime strategy is to soak you up in a series of unsustainable and exhausting interventions, then the best way to deal with that is probably not to get into a series of large-scale interventions, which is kind of what we've done uh, in some parts of the world since 9-11. The third way of thinking about the environment is to say, look, what we're actually seeing here is something that's more akin to a civil war within the Islamic world than uh, some kind of uh, movement directed directly against uh, Western powers. And I point out that Al-Qaeda got its start as a movement against the Saudi royal family and the structure of Saudi society. Ayman al-Zawahiri, the number two in Al-Qaeda, started off primarily focused on conditions in Egypt. Jamaa Islamiyah focused on conditions in uh, Indonesia. There was a whole decade-long process of these movements basically targeting what they called the near enemy of apostate regimes and oppressive governments within the Islamic world. It was only the middle of the 1990s when Al-Qaeda started to turn its attention primarily to the West, saying that, look, a lot, a lot of these regimes that we hate are being sustained by support from the international community, primarily the United States. We need to knock that support away if we're ever going to have any chance uh, of doing well against the near enemy. So there was almost a use of um, us, the West, uh, as a secondary target in order to gain objectives that were fundamentally to do with who was in charge in the Islamic world. So if there is an insurgency, maybe it's an insurgency against, inside the Islamic world rather than uh, across the world as a whole. The other element of the, uh, the internal struggle within Islam is the Shia uh, versus Sunni divide. And as you know, that only about 10% of the world's Muslims are Shia. Uh, but we've seen a process over the last seven or eight years, in fact, you could take it back to 1979, of a rise in power of Shia and Persian groups, uh, which has threatened the establishment of Sunni uh, Arab states, uh, and also threatened the stability of things like the global uh, petrochemical and, uh, and petroleum uh, economy. You have to remember that oil and gas are Shia minerals, not just uh, Muslim minerals. The eastern provinces of, of Saudi Arabia, where a lot of the oil is located, are predominantly Shia. Iran, which is the next most important uh, owner of uh, untapped oil reserves is Shia. And so there's this process where uh, the rise of uh, Shia, Shia and Persian power across the Middle East has been deeply unsettling to some uh, elements of, um, of the establishment in that part of the world. Now, clearly, by going into Iraq, overthrowing Saddam Hussein and creating the first ever Arab Shia dominated state uh, in the heart of the Middle East, we've also contributed to that deeply um, disruptive effect uh, on the broader Middle East and geopolitical dynamic. And of course, one of the problems is if this is indeed a civil war between different elements within the Islamic world, it turns out we're fighting both parties to that civil war simultaneously. We're both fighting the Taliban and opposing uh, Iranian influence. We're both fighting Al-Qaeda uh, and fighting uh, Jaysh al-Mehdi in, in Iraq. So we've come down almost like wading into the middle of somebody else's domestic dispute and within a few minutes, everybody's turned uh, against us. The third way of thinking, uh, sorry, the final way of thinking about the environment is uh, asymmetric warfare. And it comes back to this comment that I made at the start, where this general came and said to us, look, we're so dominant now that nobody's going to fight us anymore. Well, nobody's going to fight you conventionally anymore. 
but it turns out there are all sorts of other ways to fight the West than by adopting a hyper-conventional uh, sort of uber-blitzkrieg approach, which is the, uh, the preferred method of fighting uh, of the United States. So let's talk a little bit, a little bit about that. <clears throat> the United States has achieved unprecedented dominance in the, uh, the field of conventional war fighting as defined by the United States. And when I say unprecedented, I, I'm, it's, that's literally the case. Before the United States, the most dominant military power in history before the US was the British Empire. And the British Empire had what was known as the two power standard, which, which said that in the naval domain, as an aspirational goal, the British Navy would try to be as strong as the next two most powerful navies in the world combined. So as an aspiration, in just that one area of maritime uh, operations, the British tried to be as powerful as the next two countries combined. If you look at the United States today, uh, total global defence spending is about $1,100 billion a year. The US defence budget is $637 billion. So two-thirds of total defence spending, or 64 cents out of every dollar spent on defence around the world, is the US defence budget. US has become so dominant in every aspect of military endeavour, maritime, air, conventional ground warfare, intelligence, SIGINT, all those sorts of areas, that uh, it's essentially pushed every potential opponent out of the way of that US superiority. So no smart enemy is ever going to take on the United States in a direct conventional fight while it maintains this enormous dominance. And so most people have been pushed out of the way of this US uh, military power. Some have gone, if you like, above the conventional superiority into the realms of weapons of mass destruction, disruptive technologies of a variety of high-tech kinds. But most people can't afford that. And so the majority of enemies have gone below our conventional superiority into areas like terrorism and insurgency. And so to a certain extent, we've created the, the conditions we deal with today by our own conventional military dominance. That's one element of the asymmetric problem. But there are another couple of very important aspects as well. Firstly, not only is there an imbalance between the US national power and the rest of the world combined, there's a very stark imbalance within the United States between the military and non-military elements of national power. There are 1.68 million people in the US Department of Defense wearing a uniform. When you add beyond the uniform services, when you add in everybody who works in the Pentagon and all the other civilians, it's 2.1 million people in the US Department of Defense. By contrast, the State Department has about 6,000 foreign service officers, and the US Agency for International Development has about 2,000. So one way of saying that would be, you know, the state and the, the diplomatic and uh, international development arms of the US government are about the size of one army brigade. Another way of saying it would be uh, there are actually more musicians in defence bands than there are diplomats in the US Foreign Service. There are five times as many accountants in the Department of Defence as there are Foreign Service officers. Now, you don't need as many Foreign Service officers as you need soldiers. But actually, if you look around the world, the typical relationship or the typical ratio is about one to ten or one to eight between diplomats and soldiers. In the case of the US, it's one to 350. Uh, that's budget, in budget terms, one to 210 uh, in terms of personnel. And one of the impacts of that is that as we've got into this very demanding environment since 9-11, because the people with the resources are the military, we've seen this process of militarization of US foreign policy, where we have people out on the ground conducting operations which are probably not best done by the military, but only the military has the resources because they're out there and able to execute. And then there's a final element of asymmetry, which is that even within the military, there's a pretty stark imbalance between the kinds of capabilities that you need to do the operations we're engaged in now and the ones that we actually have in abundance. We have a lot of capability for the first three weeks of any war. We have very little capability for what comes after that. Uh, and again, this is, to a, to a certain extent, hardwired into the nature of uh, the American political system. It turns out that capabilities for conducting stability ops, counterinsurgency, peacekeeping, those sorts of important uh, elements of the modern warfighting environment are a lot cheaper than capabilities that you need to fight conventional wars. You know, carrier, um, aircraft carriers and 
fighter jets and all those sort of big military platforms are much, much more expensive than the sorts of capabilities that you need for low intensity conflict. And the people that control the spending is Congress and a lot of jobs in congressional districts are tied up with building those conventional platforms. So one of the problems that we face in the United States is that in order to shift the spending away from uh, conventional warfighting towards more relevant capabilities, the same people have to shift that spending whose votes and, and position in Congress depend on jobs that are tied up with building the conventional platforms. And so one of the implications of that is I don't think the United States is going to fundamentally shift away from its conventional focus anytime soon. And one of the implications of that, of course, is that the sorts of conflicts that we're seeing now, where most smart enemies try to fight us in an asymmetric way, are going to remain the basic standard uh, environment of warfighting for the foreseeable future. Uh, even if what we're dealing with now takes about half as long as the Cold War, we're still looking at a 40 or 50 year dynamic in conflict. If you look back to the wars that happened after the Second World War, the sort of 1945 to 1980 period, where Western powers pulled back from colonial possessions, we fought a series of counterinsurgencies and colonial wars, new states emerged with their own security problems, uh, and there was a need to uh, create new security architecture in various parts of the world. That process took about 45 years to play out. Uh, and you might look back and describe those as wars of decolonization. We may look back and see the wars that we're in now as wars of globalization uh, and say, you know, well, it turns out that it took about the same amount of time. So that's kind of the theoretical underpinning for the book. But then I go into a lot of detail about Iraq and Afghanistan. And I have a chapter which does, if you like, a comparative politics study looking at uh, East Timor, at Southern Thailand, uh, at Pakistan, and also at uh, the radicalization of immigrant populations uh, in the West, particularly in Europe. And essentially the, the lesson of the book is that there's a cycle. And again, this is so obvious, it, it's kind of painful to have to state it. But when you move into an environment to deal with a small radical clique, typically you create a backlash from the bulk of the population, which leads to rejection against you. And I use the analogy in the book, imagine if some burglars move into your suburb and they set up shop in some house uh, and they create a safe haven and they go and start robbing the rich people on the other side of town. If the police turn up and start blowing people's houses up in order to get to the burglars, sooner or later everybody's going to turn against the government and the burglars will become the sort of local Robin Hood. Because they're not robbing you, they're just robbing some rich guy on the other side of town. The terrorists aren't attacking people in the Hindu Kush, they're attacking people in the West. When the West comes in with drone strikes and brigades and all these sort of military elements which are fundamentally blunt instruments, we tend to get a big backlash uh, against our presence. And at the end of the book, I go through a number of potential alternatives for how we can uh, do this in a slightly different way. And essentially, it boils down to building local partnerships, seeking local solutions to local problems by working with uh, uh, local uh, governments and civil society, and also getting out of the whole mindset of intervention. Instead of going into people's countries and invading them because there are small terrorist groups, uh, there are a number of other alternatives which I go through in the book uh, as ways that we could seek to approach the problem differently. I'm going to stop there though because there's a lot more to say and I don't want to drone on about the sort of theory of things. What I want to do is throw it open to you guys and let's pick up the stuff that's more interesting to you and uh, we'll kick it around. So do you want to drive, I mean, or do you want me to... Uh... Oh, I think you're a very good driver yourself. <laughs> you, right. don't need a you don't need a driver. Uh, but it's uh, wonderful to listen to you and give us a very uh, clear summary of your book, but of course for the details you have to really read the book itself, uh, so it's open for it. Uh, could you please uh, state your name and affiliation? Oh, My name is Kim Rollins, I'm a student at ANU. I'm just wondering how serious are subnationals about establishing a shadow government within the West? How far have they penetrated our governments and institutions? And um, is there likely a state sponsor, or are they nihilistic? Are you talking specifically about uh, militant extremist groups in the Islamic setting, or are you talking about just generically? Yeah, not yeah. Basically, well, Islamic, I suppose. Uh, you know, Al Qaeda, uh, Hezbollah, whoever. How far? How serious are they about establishing a shadow government? They say they want a caliphate. How serious are they? How far have they gone in the architectural plan of that? And how likely have they penetrated our governments or institutions? <laughs> 
Uh, you know, like say the, the Russians tried to in the Cold War, they're interested about bringing us down. Would they not be doing that together with uh, an insurgency type conflict? Well, or are they nihilistic? Yeah, what, what you're talking about to a certain extent is, is the concept of subversion, which is a component in any insurgency. Looking at Al Qaeda specifically, I don't think it's as organised or as coherent as that. There's always been a number of different points of view, even within the core Al Qaeda group. And uh, outside that core group, there are a number of loose, if you like, shifting tactical alliances of convenience between different extremist groups who are all pursuing their own agenda, but cooperating loosely when it suits their, uh, their broader objectives. I think since 9-11, we've actually seen a pretty substantial collapse in support for Al Qaeda across large parts of the Muslim world. Uh, Indonesia is perhaps the most striking example uh, where we've seen Jamaat Islamiya go from uh, you know, a reasonable degree of operational capability uh, towards the end of the 1990s to being pretty heavily dis um, disrupted now. We also now have a whole section of Jamaat Islamiya saying, listen, we haven't achieved what we wanted through the terrorist struggle. Let's go back to being an ordinary political party and see how we can you know, go in the, in the parliamentary process. But then you can look at other groups like the Tabliki Jamaat, you can look at Muslim Brotherhood, uh, you can look at some other groups in Europe, um, Hizb ut to a certain extent, that have taken a more kind of Leninist approach where they've tried to almost consciously be the vanguard of disaffected groups within immigrant populations. Uh, and I think that, that approach by those guys has, ha has carried them a little bit further than the essentially intimidatory approach of Al-Qaeda. So it's kind of a, it's a, it's a mosaic across different uh, parts of the world. My, sort of my final observation would be uh, in the study that I did on European radicalization, one of the striking conclusions was that the more coherent and well organized an immigrant population, the more effective the authority structures within that, or, or that population, the less likely you are to see um, terrorism and uh, internal violence. And that's a factor that really doesn't have much to do with the belief system. You can have a fairly um, fundamentalist, if you like, belief system uh, in place. But as long as there's strong, coherent internal authority structures, that doesn't tend to translate into violence. I've been from that. Yeah. Native Prouty was uh, you know, an FBI, CIA agent yeah. who had links with Hezbollah, right. was in the Baghdad uh, embassy. How likely is that to be repeated? Or well, we've seen, it. It we've seen a number of cases of that. There was an uh, AIVD officer, the Dutch intelligence, um, who was uh, uh, linked to uh, one of the radical groups in the Netherlands. There have been a couple of cases of people trying to join MI5. Um, but again, I don't, I don't know that much about the Cold War, but even, even in my you know, limited understanding of it, I don't think even then that things were quite as organised as they seem looking back. Uh, and I certainly don't think that we're seeing a sort of worldwide uh, conspiracy to penetrate uh, organs of, of Western government. No state sponsor like Iran? Sorry? No state sponsor like Iran? Uh, well, that's not to say that states aren't out there trying to do stuff. I'm just saying that it's not necessarily as coherent as all that. Um, if you're looking for Iranian uh, subversion and penetration, uh, Iran and Afghanistan, sorry, um, Afghanistan and Iraq are the two places where it's most prominent, where you've seen uh, Iranian influence. But I would interpret that as a defensive action on the part of the Tehran regime to say, listen, don't strike our regime don't try and unseat uh, the, the government here because we can hit you elsewhere. And even the way that Hezbollah and um, other elements have worked in South America would be part of that broader picture. But again, that's, that's geopolitics relating to Iran rather than some kind of uh, world conspiracy. Yes, we'll go Dave, uh, right. Peter Rickson, man. Good How are you doing, mate? Good. Look, um, you, Jim Mullen, and uh, David Petraeus collectively uh, are creating a bit of a conundrum for the community broadly in that nobody's questioning the logic of local partnerships, it seems to make sense. But Jim Mullen's arguing that to be effective in Afghanistan, we need 20 security troops per thousand personnel. You and David Petraeus crafted a strategy that seems to be roughly 28 to 1,000. How do you get this local partnerships without this massive military intervention and therefore create, create the very preconditions which you argue against in the book. Yeah, you know, when we wrote the manual, the, the, the US counterinsurgency manual, we struggled for weeks about this issue of are we going to put this number in? Um, and eventually they decided to put the number in of 20 counterinsurgents per thousand population. Um, but there's about three pages of caveats that come after that. No one ever reads that. They're like, oh, well, you're not getting the numbers. Um, the, the thing is, um, that number is supposed to be all 
elements, not just Western forces. So it includes police, it includes local security forces, it includes Afghan uh, police and military. Basically, it's, it's the full spectrum. Uh, and it, you don't need to establish that level of numbers across the whole country. There are a lot, I mean, if you, if you drew a, a line east to west across um, Afghanistan between Herat and Jalalabad, south of the line, which is about um, a third to just slightly less than half of the population of Afghanistan, so about 15 million people, that's the area, the sort of counterinsurgency zone, where you need to be looking to achieve that level of, um, of, of manpower. But it's from all sources, not just, um, uh, not just Western. North of the line, it's more of a re reconstruction and development problem. But that doesn't mean it's not a problem. I, I had a conversation with the governor of Badakhshan who said to me, who do I have to shoot around here to get some international assistance? Right? Because what we've been doing is putting a lot of our effort into the south, and people in the north of the country are sort of losing a bit of patience uh, with that. So I guess back to the numbers. Um, the, local the local partnerships are critical. You achieve those local partnerships by convincing people that they're better off on your side than on the enemy's side. And the fundamental way you do that is by protecting them. So it's a chicken and egg. You've got to have enough troops on the ground to protect people, to make them feel safe enough to turn against the enemy. That's what we achieved in Anbar, but it took several years of fighting to get us to that point. And one of the things I talk about in the book is what I call the arithmetic of local partnerships. And I use the Anbar example, and I say, let's look at 2007. If we had had 50,000 additional US troops available to put into Iraq, and we didn't have them, but if we did, about 40 out of the 50,000 would have been soaked up in things like guarding lines of communication, running headquarters, doing the non-combat functions, and also the rotation plan, okay? Because you've got to have some people out on the ground, some people getting ready to operate, and some people resting. So by the time you do that, your bang for the buck is about 10,000 guys out on the ground at any one time. And then I say, let's look at what we did instead, which was to recruit about 50,000 Iraqis to work for us. We didn't have a rotation plan because they all lived out on the ground. There were no lines of communication to guard. There were certainly no non-combat functions. So all 50,000 of those guys were engaged against the enemy. But the benefit that we got wasn't 50,000. It was closer to 100,000 because most of those people who are now working for us had previously been in the enemy's recruiting base. So when you work with local partners, the bang for the buck is conservatively about 10 times what you get by putting in more Western forces. Um, so again, it's chicken and egg. We've got to create environments where people feel safe enough to stop supporting the enemy and start working with us, and then expand those sort of ink spots, as people sometimes talk about it. Um, this is one of the differences between conventional, traditional, classical counterinsurgency and what we're dealing with now, because this is a tribal environment. It's not a peasant society. You don't win or lose people by creating conditions that individually motivate them to work with you or against you. What you do is you win over local tribal leaders and you win or lose these people a valley or a village at a time. Uh, in Iraq, we, we, we did that very effectively after a long period of getting it wrong. In the parts of Afghanistan where we've had a lot of success, which is mainly in the east of the country so far, uh, it's been by adopting a similar approach. The tribes, I won't get into the tribal structure of Afghanistan, but the tribes in the south of Afghanistan are very different from in the east. And they're also very eroded structures now after 30 years of war. So I think it's going to be more of a district-based rather than tribal-based model in the south of Afghanistan. But if we are going to succeed, it's going to be about building these local partnerships and then expanding that as we did in uh, other parts of the conflict. Yeah, Ian Wallace is my name. I'm a zoologist here at ANU, so I can't be much further removed from this whole field. But I'm deadly serious with the question. It seems that I've been to dozens of talks like yours, and we always end up with this same thing, that we go in and attack people and bomb them and all this, and things just get worse. And if you look at Australian history, and I haven't studied it a lot, but it seems that we have a department of offence rather than one of defence. We get into every biff that's ever going on, and it, in my way of thinking, why don't those people come and have a go at us? And what, how could we complain? So my question is, why don't we set an example and just get rid of our defence forces? And spend that money on being nice rather than getting into this stuff. And what would be the disadvantage of doing that? Mm, that's an interesting point. And it's one that comes up uh, fairly frequently, I think. And I, I think you can certainly make the case that... Um, most of the foreign interventions that, that any Western power has engaged in since the Second World War have generated some kind of a backlash like this. But then if you, if you break it down, you can see that there are actually different ways of intervening, and some are much li more likely to create the backlash than others are. 
And then if you step even further back, you can say you can actually get beyond that whole model of intervention, which is basically a beginning, a middle and an end, and instead of that, look to a process of continuous engagement where you're trying to deal with uh, problems in a, uh, a non-intrusive way. Um, and, you know, I was a soldier for 25 years, so I'm not going to sign up for the abolition of the Defence Force. Um, but I think, you know, a lot of people have made a false dichotomy between having a powerful military and having an effective aid uh, and diplomatic uh, and uh, information capacity and so on. Actually, the disparity that I outlined before is so great that you could multiply the di diplomats and aid guys by a factor of 10. It's only going to be a marginal difference to defence spending. Um, and I think one of the most important things we need to see happening uh, in the next few years is moving away from this militarised foreign policy towards a, a balance where you say, look, the military is good for some things, but using them for things they're not, ident they're not uh, well adapted for is ultimately counterproductive, not only for foreign policy, but for the military as well. Um, and we need to sort of get into a much more balanced approach. I'm reasonably happy with where the Obama administration has come out on a lot of this stuff. It's still very early in, in terms of their, their term of office, and we haven't seen them act on a lot of the rhetoric yet. But the way they're talking tends to suggest that they're going to take a more balanced view. And it'll be very interesting to watch the Quadrennial Defence Review, which is a four-yearly report that the US Department of Defence puts out, and to watch what happens to the balance between conventional warfighting and all these other elements that you're talking about um, as, it, as it comes out. I'm Colin Campbell from the University of Virginia. Very comment. Um, I didn't suffer a stroke, so I might not be that clear. But uh, I read your book and I found, found it very interesting and it supported a great deal of what I read. But I, one thing I wonder about is where accidental guerrilla comes from. It, it, it seems to me that it you know, misses the point. And, uh, and uh, I just wonder if you could expose a little bit of where that title came from. Well, the name came from a conversation that I had in the tribal areas in Pakistan in 2006. But the argument is that <clears throat> um, a substantial proportion of the people that we're fighting in most of these conflicts, and I would say conservatively about 95 per cent, are fighting us not because they hate the West or because they, they're coming after us because they have any kind of offensive intent. They're coming after us primarily because we turned up in their valley with a brigade or some other intervention force and created a backlash by the way that we behaved on the ground. And I use a number of examples in the book. One of them is from Afghanistan, actually from Oruzgan province, where the Australians are operating now. Uh, this was before there was a large-scale Australian presence. But there was a big ambush in May of 2006 where a US Special Forces patrol was pinned down for six hours. And the reason that it was held down for this length of time was not only because there was a very effective Taliban ambush, but also because people from a lot of local villages saw the firefight start went home and got their weapons and came back and joined in. Uh, and after the firefight, we interviewed a lot of these guys. And we said, listen, you know, we didn't think you supported the Taliban. So why were you shooting at us? And the guys were like, well, we don't support the Taliban. And we said, well, then forgive the question, but, you know, why were you trying to kill our guys? And one of the guys said to us, look, you have to understand how boring it is to be a teenager in a village in central Afghanistan. <laughs> this firefight that just happened, this is the most exciting thing that's happened in our valley for 20 years. And it would have been completely dishonourable for us to sit out the firefight. You know, what he said was that we would have been women, um, but that's the way Afghans talk. Um, and we said, OK, but, you know, why the Taliban? And he said, well, if you're going to join into a firefight, you're not going to join in on the side of the infidel foreigner. You're going to join in on the side of the Afghan. Sorry. And it was almost like nothing personal, just business. You know, that was kind of the attitude that we got from those guys. I saw very, very similar attitudes on the ground. Um, from Iraqis. Um, one of my experiences in Iraq during the surge was that um, I started off, I was General Petraeus' senior advisor, and for the first half of my tour, most of what I was trying to do was to reorient what the units on the ground were doing to be more effective in terms of counterinsurgency. But about halfway through the, the tour, the Sunni awakenings, the Sahawa, started to really build up. And we had a whole series of uh, completely unexpected interactions with the Iraqis. And one area was uh, a suburb called Amaria in downtown Baghdad. And I found myself in a mosque at midnight talking to a guy who a week before had been a senior Sunni insurgent leader fighting us. And he said to me, this is great, you know, because we didn't realise that you guys were so willing to partner with us and fight Al-Qaeda. And it's great that we've now partnered up. We're going to drive these Al-Qaeda dogs out of our district and then we're going to turn on the Shia. And... <laughs> I was like, 
that's kind of not in the plan, you know. Um, and and he said, but why? You know, um, you know, it, it, we're, we're fighting to protect our community. The biggest threat to our community is Al Qaeda. The second biggest threat is the Iraqi government. You know, and clearly you recognise that. So there's people come into these fights for reasons that don't always appear obvious. You know, and um, one of the biggest problems we had in Iraq was failure to understand the enemy's motivation. In Vietnam, there was a detailed RAND Corporation study called the Viet Cong Motivation and Morale Study. It was a nine-volume work that took several years to produce, and it went through on the basis of exhaustive interviews and identified the main motivation of uh, the insurgents in, uh, in Vietnam. We never had anything like that in Iraq. And we had people like Donald Rumsfeld saying, they're just evildoers, you know, they hate us because of who we are, all that kind of stuff. When we actually turned up at the start of the, the surge, we said, if you're going to commit a lot of troops, you should probably commit a lot of thought as well. And we went in and did detailed studies of what the motivation was of everybody that we had ever detained in Iraq. Now, there's an analytical problem with that because the detainees are a subset of insurgents and not necessarily uh, a reflective one. But it turned out that on the basis of that work, about 70% of the people that were fighting us were primarily economically motivated and motivated by uh, local issues in their own community. About 20% were members of the former establishment who'd been dispossessed and were trying to basically get back in the game. And less than 10% were primarily motivated by ideology or fanatical uh, terrorist or religious um, motivation. On the basis of that, we said, right, most of our effort needs to be social and economic. And we also need to find a way to offer these people that were dispossessed a way back into the game that doesn't involve violence. And so we came up with a strategy for co-opting about 90% of the people we were fighting and killing or capturing just that hardcore 10% that proved themselves to be irreconcilable. And that strategy, as you probably know, completely transformed the, the, the conflict within a matter of uh, months. So I think that um, it's a complex picture, but the reason that I use the term accidental guerrilla is that's what a, a Pakistani tribal leader um, used to describe it to me. But I think a lot of the people that are fighting us are fighting us by accident or through circumstance rather than because they were opposed to the West initially. And we have to find a way of dealing with that very small radical clique without also alienating everybody else in the society. And I think that large-scale intervention is probably not the way to go. Let's take a couple of uh, questions from this side. I'm going to go there. And then, yes. um, David, Tony Burke from the University of New South Wales and Hope. Hi, Tony. Good to see you again. Good to see you too. Now, um, you talk about creating local partnerships, but obviously Northwest Pakistan, obviously very serious challenges here. Um, so I'm just wondering, you know, when we think of what local partnerships were there in the past, it was between the Army, the ISI, and the Taliban, and other extremist groups. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering what your reading of the offence with SWAT is, um, and I know that the ISI got some nasty blowback with this bombing in Lahore last week or two. <coughs> what's the challenge up there, and what's the best way of, of dealing with it? Well, you know, in the book I quote from Churchill, from 1897, um, uh, he was involved in, in the campaign in, in the so-called Great Frontier War at the end of the 19th century. Um, and he talks about going into a valley in Bajar Agency, which is the northern part of the Fatah, and actually blowing up about 12 villages in order to punish the population for supporting this radical um, Islamic movement that had been fighting the British uh, Empire. And one of the villages that they blew up was a village called Damadola. That same village we struck four times between 2006 and 2008 trying to get senior al-Qaeda leadership. So we have been blowing people up. Western powers have been blowing these people up for about 120 years. Um, when, when you actually sort of put it into that context, um, sort of band-aid solutions like so-called hearts and minds are not going to cut it here. Uh, you, you're looking for a fundamental political transformation in terms of conditions on the ground. That is something that Westerners just can't do. We can't go in there and create these kind of structures. The history of the Fatah is even more complicated than that because between 1849 and 1947, when the British controlled, loosely controlled that area, the British Army sent a military punitive operation into the Fatah area on average once a year. So every year out of those 98 years, there was some kind of British uh, colonial intervention going on. In 1947, as Pakistan was being formed, the tribes in that area were of a secessionist frame of mind. And uh, Jinnah, the, the first um, 
the leader of Pakistan, had a meeting with the tribes from Waziristan and basically did a deal with them where he said, listen, nominally, you need to stay part of Pakistan. In return for that, we guarantee you the army will never come in in a punitive fashion uh, and attack you in the Fatah, and no taxes will be levied and Pakistani law will not apply to the tribal areas. That was the basic deal. That deal stuck until the Tira Valley campaign of 2002, when at Western urging, the Pakistani military for the first time ever went into the tribal areas on a war footing. And if you think about the way that the structure worked up there, it was almost a tacit deal between the tribes and the government, where the arrangement was, if you sit down quietly under the Malik and the political agent and the Khasadars and all the other elements of the frontier crimes regulations, if you sit down quietly, we'll leave you alone. But if you cause trouble, the army's going to come in and they're going to kick your ass. Okay? Now, in 2002, the army came in and they lost. So they called their own bluff. And the whole basis for the system broke down. And by 2004, whole tribal confederations across the Fatah were in open warfare against the government because the basic system uh, had broken down. Um, there's one ray of sunshine here, which is if you look at the Pakistani military over the last two or three years, they have improved dramatically in their understanding of how to fight uh, in the frontier. And in last year's campaign in Malakan Division and Bajar, we finally saw the Frontier Corps starting to build local alliances and working with people. In the past, they used tribal Lashkars as kind of a fig leaf. So they would go in, they'd lose, and they'd kind of say, oh, hospital pass, you know, tribes, you got it, and then they'd back out. Um, now they're actually going in and trying to work with the population. That has been very effective, but it's largely restricted to the Fatah. In the SWAT area, they've gone in with pretty much a completely military offensive. And so we're going to see um, violence start to spike in other parts of Pakistan as the militants try to hit back. And we're also going to see the, ma the militants move out of SWAT uh, and probably head back up into the areas where they were before. So we're going to see some spillover. Um, the Pakistanis are a lot better in that military dimension, but there are a lot of other things involved in effective counterinsurgency, as you well know. And we haven't seen much emphasis on the governance part or on the development part or on the information campaign. Uh, it's very much a one-trick pony right now. So I think this is going to play out over the next several months. And I think also, you know, don't forget that we're about to put nearly 30,000 more troops in Afghanistan. Uh, and the enemy is going to go somewhere. You know, you push, that, push them in to Afghanistan, particularly the south. Where are all those, those Taliban going to go? And some of them are going to go to Pakistan. So I think we've got a pretty torrid time coming up in the next year or so in Pakistan, particularly between now and the Afghan elections. David Ingrid Larson, I'm a master's student here Hi. at the centre. I note that you said um, building local partnerships and working with local governments is the way forward. So, um, considering Iraq has just been labelled the most corrupt country in the world, how do you advocate dealing with corruption and how does that differ from dealing with the culture of what's stuck in Iraq? Yeah, well, <clears throat> this is a general problem with any kind of overseas counterinsurgency or intervention. In order to uh, forge effective partnerships with local communities, you have to engage with them on a way that, in a way that kind of um, is understood in their value system. But in order to sustain the intervention with domestic political support from home countries, you've also got to show that you know, you're supporting Western values to a certain extent. In the case of Afghanistan, women's literacy has become an issue. Um, you know, women's literacy in the Fatah is about 6%. In Afghanistan, generally, it's 12%. Um, and, you know, one of the reasons for that is Pashtun men like it like that, okay? So when you go into the environment, one of the problems for maintaining support from a Western population base is you've got to be seen to be doing something about women's rights, women's reproductive freedom, uh, women's control over the means of production, all those sorts of things that are actually, as we all know in the development community, very important in terms of generating progress. But by so doing, you're actually alienating some of the very people that you need to work with, the male tribal leaders who are against that. So it's a balance that has to be struck. And corruption is, again, one of these problems um, where some things that we see as corrupt, the local population don't. And some things that the local population sees as corrupt, we see as sort of normal. And so there's a frame of reference issue in terms of deciding which elements you're going to focus on. The areas where we've had success in Iraq um, have mainly come down to what I would call local monitoring. So we had a huge amount of corruption and abuse by the police in 2007. Um, in fact, I'd go further than that. We had death squad activity by the Iraqi police, but also a lot of corruption and, and misrule. How we eventually solved that in the context of the surge only was we said we are never going to deploy an Iraqi police unit by itself. 
there's always going to be an Iraqi military unit and a coalition military unit always operating together to the lowest possible level. And what we found when we did that was that the performance of all three elements improved. So the Western guys suddenly are partnered with an Iraqi who understands the environment and can say, hey, that guy's not from here, or you know, that village isn't a bad village, that's just a bad guy, and they can give that sort of local colour, which means that your intervention is a lot less ham-fisted. You know? But then the local military also have the benefit of they have access to our mobility, our protection, uh, firepower, all those sorts of things that allow them to operate, and they don't need to be engaging in death squad activity because they have other mechanisms for achieving what they need to do. So it improves their performance. But the most important effect was on the police because the police officer who previously was exploiting the population with impunity now has a Western military guy and an Iraqi military guy standing next to him, and they're like, why did you just beat that old lady up? You know, why did you take that guy's money? And there's this kind of um, monitoring and sort of invigilation of behaviour on the ground. Um, when you take that approach and you marry it up with a, a local governance approach where you have a similar kind of ombudsman function, uh, that's, the, that's what we've done that's succeeded the most in parts of Iraq and Afghanistan where we've tried it. But we're yet to apply that at the national level. We're yet to actually do it in a uniform fashion across all the countries that we're engaged in. And I think governance, rule of law, uh, anti-corruption, all those sorts of things, ultimately, that's where we're going to make our money in this type of activity. Getting in and dealing with the enemy, that's actually, it's difficult, but it's relatively short-lived. If you do it right, it's over in a few weeks. And then you have this long-term problem of rebuilding legitimate governance and uh, non-corrupt administrative systems. Uh, and that's where the real difficulty lies. And uh, probably the area, again, because we're so militarised in, in our approach to this, it's one of the areas we haven't put a lot of emphasis on. But we're going to have to if we're going to succeed. I'm afraid we have uh, time only for two more sh uh, short questions. Uh, we will go to Professor William Mealy there, and then we will come for another one. <coughs> yeah. Thank you. Uh, William Mealy from the Australian National University. Uh, I was wondering how one goes about persuading locals that uh, international forces, even if they're configured to play a protective role for local communities in cooperation with them, are going to be there for the long run. Because uh, certainly in Afghanistan since 2002 onwards, there's been a real problem that a lot of people have had the sense that with the blocking of ISAF expansion uh, in 2002, uh, the West was already thinking about an economic <coughs> in which case if you're offensive, it's not a brilliant idea to throw yourself robustly behind a program of transition if you could be left high and dry at a certain point in the future. Yeah, no, I completely agree. And, uh, you know, you've taught me more about Afghanistan than anyone else. So, you know, I think the, um, you know, one of the things that you wrote about a few years ago is how the Karzai government used um, positions of authority in its own structure as kind of political goods to buy off different groups. And that tended to render the government dysfunctional. You know, you have different branches of government who don't want to work with each other because they belong to different factions. And the same thing, of course, is translated down to the lower level. And the failure to hold district elections, as promised after the Bonn Agreement, created this whole backlash of people feeling like their local representatives weren't legitimate. Now, where we have had some success is in getting in there and acting as an honest broker, you know, and saying, um, look, we know that the guy who's in charge of the district is not from your majority tribe and we know he's been exploitative. We're going to act in a way to, to sort of rein in some of those abuses. That's been successful in some places, but I don't think you can take it as a, a general pattern. Um, I think that on the whole, you can only be as successful in these environments as the local government is. And that means that building local government effectiveness and state effectiveness, if you like, is probably a more important path than some of the military stuff we've been doing. I've actually been watching Somalia very closely. There are a number of um, conflicts that I didn't write about in the book because I try to be very rigorous methodologically and only write about stuff where I had personal first-hand field research experience. So I left out Israel-Palestine and Chechnya and Kashmir and Somalia because they haven't operated on the ground there. But one of the things we've seen in Somali land over the past seven or eight years, the northern part of Somalia, is a process of bottom-up state formation that we haven't really seen anywhere else except for in the parts of Afghanistan and Iraq where we tried something like that since 2001. And I think there's a lot to be learned. There's probably several you know, PhD dissertations or master's theses in how does a state get formed from the bottom up? And if you look at what happened in Somaliland, it was a series of clan peace deals that led to larger district agreements that then led to people saying, well, we need to, it's almost a sort of traditional social compact, you know, um, developing it uh, in the raw. 
We saw the same sort of things in Anbar, and we've seen some of it in parts of eastern Afghanistan where we've had some success. Um, maybe that's a, a more viable model than the model that we've had of going in at the central level of the state and trying to build top down. I don't know, you talk about um, Joel Migdal's you know, functions of the state, and I think that's a very good way of thinking about it in terms of the things that a state has to do, regardless of how it's structured. Um, you know, tribes are a form of government without states. Uh, and if you look at what effective tribes do in parts of eastern Afghanistan, the places where we've been most effective is where we've mimicked that kind of activity. Um, we tend to get all kind of horrified by our own success when we do that because we know that's not what we're supposed to be doing. You know, in Iraq, we achieved a lot of success with bottom-up tribal deals completely against orders. You know, I mean, the direction from Washington was not that. It was to build state institutions from the top down. The only reason they jumped on board with it was because it was working. Uh, but, you know, um, just because things work in practice is not necessarily a sound enough reason for governments to do them, as you know. Andy John, the question I have is just about Afghanistan. Um, given your comments about Western intervention have, causing a backlash and, and a possible uh, uh, yeah, inadvertent effects, what, what do you think about the surge that, that we're seeing in, in Afghanistan? How do you think that, that plays out in terms of what your comments? Yeah, well, I think one of the things about this is it's a very localised effect. Okay, so people don't fight you um, in Kapisa because of something that you're doing in the Hazarajat. You know, they fight you because of what you're doing in the Taga Valley or some other major part of Kapisa province. People don't fight you in Uruzgan because of what the British are doing in Helmand. It's, it's a local effect, this, this backlash effect. Um, and it all depends on what we do with those troops. If the troops go in primarily to fight the enemy and chase the bad guys around, I think we will get an even more severe backlash response. If they go in in a sort of a residential approach to live shoulder to shoulder with the population and protect them against all comers, including their own corrupt government at times, uh, then we'll see uh, uh, some, some change in the, in the political dynamic. Um, will that happen? It's very hard to know. I don't see a huge amount of evidence of it so far. I think most of the troops, I mean, President Obama committed 17,000 uh, combat troops and 4,000 trainers. But if you look at what the trainers are doing, they're actually combat troops because they're going to be accompanying the, um, the Afghan military. So you've got, by the time you add in all the European commitments, you've got about 25,000 new combat troops coming into Afghanistan in the next year. We're going to see a spike in violence. It's just inevitable because you've got more troops on the ground, more fighting happening. Um, so tracking levels of violence in Afghanistan is not actually going to be a very good metric of success, I don't think, in the next 12 months. They're going to go up whether we're winning or losing. The measure, measure of success is whether Afghans feel safe enough to put down the weapon and commit to one side or the other and engage in unarmed politics. And back to what um, Professor Maley was saying, I've talked to a lot of families on the ground, uh, in mainly in Kandahar province but also in the north, who have one son fighting with the Taliban and one son with the government. Right? And it's not that they're uncommitted, it, they're survivors. They've just survived 30 years of war and it's an insurance policy. Um, and they need to see long-term commitment. Uh, and I think that has to, have, has to be Afghan. And it can't be spin, right? It can't be like we go in there and we put a pretty Afghan face on things. It, that's not going to cut it. It has to be a genuine Afghan solution, uh, which gets you back to who are the political leaders, where does their legitimacy come from? Uh, and fundamentally, again, that's, that's a local effect. Well, David, thank you very much. Thank I you. hope we have an uh, exhausted trip. Thank you. And here is Thanks for having me. Here is a little thing oh. so that you could come back. Thank you. One day after, after you've opened it. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Uh, our next uh, public lecture is going to be next Thursday by... Uh, uh, His Royal Highness uh, Prince Turkey Al Faisal, who was the chief of the Saudi intelligence for some 20 years and had a lot to do with the Taliban and the rest of all these people, and including Al Qaeda, and he will be giving a lecture at 2 o'clock next uh, Thursday. Okay. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Many thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Many thanks.